Welcome to Potter Park Zoo, the Little Zoo by the Red Cedar. If those words sound at all familiar, that was how I opened my first ever exhibit tour episode. While I did just feature the zoo a couple months ago, it has been over two years since Potter Park received an exhibit tour feature. The main reason for that is that the majority of the zoo isn't really divided up in a way that's conducive to exhibit-based tours, but that doesn't mean it doesn't deserve to be featured. So, to accomplish that, we'll be embarking on a two-part full zoo tour showing everything Potter Park has to offer. Potter Park Zoo is a 20-acre zoo located in Michigan's capital city of Lansing. Although I claimed it to be in my first episode, this time around, the info I found did not support the idea that Potter Park is Michigan's oldest zoo, but it does predate the more well-known Detroit Zoo by nearly a decade. Potter Park's story began in 1920, when it opened with a handful of animals including elk, a bear, a pair of raccoons, and some deer. Today, the zoo's collection is a little more impressive, featuring over 350 animals, so let's go meet them. While the zoo can be traversed in either direction, you are encouraged to begin your adventure to the left, with two habitats that opened in 2005, giving the zoo's entry area a North American theme. The first, more simple yard is home to the Arctic Fox. Male Atreyu and Female Sparkle You probably picture arctic foxes in their beautiful white winter coats, which help them blend in with the snowy landscape. But in summer, their coats become thinner and can range in color from dark and light grays to charcoal brown. Like polar bears, the skin under their fur coat has dark pigmentation which better absorbs and retains heat to help them stay warm in the frigid arctic. While arctic foxes may not come to mind when you think of rare zoo species, of the 25 AZA zoos I've visited, only three currently display arctic foxes, which, in my eyes, makes them an excellent species to begin your day at the zoo. In contrast, our next species seems to be at every zoo, but that doesn't stop the crowds from loving them. The North American River Otter. The zoo is home to breeding pair Miles and Nakeke. Miles was the first otter ever born at Potter Park Zoo back in 2013, but otter pups are now a common sight around here since Miles and Nakeke, who came from Roger Williams Park Zoo in 2016, have now welcomed four litters and ten total pups together. Their habitat, of course, comes with underwater viewing, as well as two additional vantage points that follow the mini forest and small stream that makes up the rest of their exhibit. Opposite the otters is a good-sized aviary for rescued bald eagles Hal and Luca. Hal is partially able to fly, so you'll likely find him perched higher up, while Luca is more likely to be roaming around on the ground. This pair are two of the most cooperative photography subjects I've had the pleasure of photographing on my zoo travels, and I have them to thank for most of my best bald eagle photos. I've briefly talked about their conservation story before, but since I do have so much footage of these two, now seems like an ideal time to touch up on a few details. DDT was among the first synthetic insecticides, and quickly grew in popularity due to its effectiveness. However, it soon made its way into waterways, and thus into the eagle's main food source. Eating contaminated fish caused the eagles to lay fragile eggs that failed to hatch chicks, and the population soon plummeted. In 1963, there were only 417 breeding pairs of bald eagles in the lower 48 states, but thanks to protection from the Bald Eagle Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act, and most of all the elimination of DDT use, the population was soon on the road to recovery. By 1997, the number of breeding pairs was at 5,000, and in 2007, the species was removed from the endangered species list. A short stroll down the path is a much smaller bird of prey, weighing in at around 5 ounces. It's the American Kestrel. These tiny raptors show some interesting differences between sexes. Males have bluish colored wings, while the female's wings are the same rusty color as much of the rest of their body. In wintertime, when kestrels migrate south, females inhabit more open habitat, while males are more likely to be spotted in wooded areas.
past them, the next habitat used to continue the North American theme with gray wolves, before the last two remaining wolves moved to a zoo in New York in 2022, making way for tufted deer, who were already at the zoo, having bounced around a few exhibits in recent years. Of the three tufted deer subspecies, the western tufted deer of southern China is the largest. These shy deer are usually found living solitary or in pairs, they communicate using a plethora of interesting vocalizations, including clicks, barks, and whistles. Across the path is a boarded-up viewing area that now features a monarch butterfly display. This used to be the primary viewing for a large yard where I first saw ostrich and scimitar-horned oryx, next came kangaroos and emus, and then the tufted deer who now live across the path. We'll find out who inhabits the exhibit nowadays when we reach its newly added viewing area. The next habitat also recently switched residents. Once the home of ravens, you'll now find Ragnar and Rollo, four-year-old Canadian lynx brothers who arrived from the Pittsburgh Zoo earlier this year. The word lynx comes from Greek meaning to shine, which may be in reference to the reflective abilities of the cat's eyes. Despite being over a hundred pounds lighter, the Canada lynx has larger paws than the mountain lion. These massive paws act as snowshoes to help the lynx maneuver through snow. Rather than using speed, the Canada lynx specializes in ambush hunting. Passing by the Camel Ride Station, you're offered three directions in which to continue your journey. We'll be heading to the right, to an exhibit that was once a rather barren cage for spider monkeys, but received a much needed makeover, transforming it into a much better home for red pandas. The habitat is now filled with climbing opportunities for this arboreal species, and comes complete with indoor viewing, as well as a smaller cage within the outdoor habitat that I believe is used for introducing cubs to the exhibit. Something that has been happening quite a lot around here, since breeding pair Malia and Deegan Reed just welcomed their third successful litter of cubs together in June of this year. Continuing past the red pandas is the brand new viewing for the Okapi Forest. Earlier this year, the zoo welcomed Elumbe, a five-year-old male whose name means brave one in the Lingala language. The elusive Okapi is found only in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The animal was long known to the indigenous people of Africa, but for Westerners who had yet to see the creature, it took on a mythical status, being dubbed the African Unicorn, until a skull and skin were finally obtained by Sir Harry Hamilton Johnston in 1901. Even today, sightings remain rare, and the first image of a wild okapi was not taken until 2008. Backtracking past the red pandas is the farmyard. I usually omit or skim over areas dedicated to domestic animals in my videos, but remember this is a full zoo tour, so here's a brief overview of what you can expect to find in the farmyard. Starting on the left, there's Dexter Cattle Sisters Fresca and Fontina. The centerpiece is of course a large petting yard for goats of the American Pygmy, Nigerian Dwarf, and Kinder variety. And around the right outside of the pathway are yards for guinea hogs, Sicilian donkeys, and both Surrey and Wakaya alpacas. Surrey alpacas have a longer silky coat and more sleek appearance, while the Wakaya alpacas have a softer, fluffier coat and more round appearance. Now that we didn't completely ignore the farm animals, we can move on to what I consider to be the centerpiece of the entire zoo, the 86-year-old feline and primate building, which received a major renovation in 1989 and which I have already featured on its own tour. So if you want a complete breakdown of this building, click on the card above. However, assuming you just went and watched that episode, here's some updates on the changes that have occurred in the last two years. The zoo transferred their resident Amur Tiger Timmy to the Louisville Zoo and received Vicente, a 14-year-old male from Louisville in return. 
Similarly, the zoo swapped male Palace's cats, sending out Olaf, and receiving a younger male named Pozzi, who is now my personal favorite animal at the zoo, since he was the first individual of this very photogenic species that I actually had any luck photographing, and because I have yet to fail to see him active on my three visits since his arrival. And the final cat update, the zoo's elderly lioness Ulana passed away at an impressive age of 19, leaving their 17-year-old male Coda as the zoo's lone lion for the time being. Something that I didn't mention on my original feline and primate building tour is that directly across from the tigers you'll find a mixed species South American habitat for Patagonian cavies who live with Wayne the Giant Anteater, who arrived at the zoo back in 2017. Anteaters walk on their fist, which may look uncomfortable but helps keep their long claws sharp for use in attacking insect nests or for defense against predators. A giant anteater's sense of smell is 40 times stronger than our own. While it may be logical to assume that anteaters have some natural immunity to bites from the bugs they regularly feed on, this is actually not the case. Instead, giant anteaters will feed on a nest for only about a minute and leave before the insects can properly organize an attack. As you loop past the outdoor lion habitat and head around the other side of the feline and primate building, you'll arrive at the outdoor primate half of the building, where, on my most recent visit, I had the opportunity to see the zoo's three-week-old ring-tailed lemur pup, the third born to parents Maddie and Han, since the pair was brought together on a breeding recommendation in 2022. More changes appear to be on the horizon for the historic feline and primate building. Recently, the zoo announced that they have received $10 million in state funding to restore and upgrade the building, which will include new holdings and renovated outdoor homes for the felines, and renovated and expanded indoor and outdoor homes for the primates. And this is where we'll conclude part one of our tour through Potter Park Zoo. Next week, we'll continue our journey with my favorite animal, more breeding successes, and the zoo's best exhibit.